Um, okay, let's start. Uh, my name is Alfredo Ortega. I work as a explorer writer for Core Security. Um, this talk will be about the OpenBSD bug. If you don't understand something that I am saying, just ask me and I will repeat. Um, okay. This is a um, bug that I discovered a couple of months ago, well, like more four months ago, and it's uh, a little in a interesting bug, and uh, the exploit is interesting too, and got a, a pretty much publicity, so I, I'm going to explain it. Okay. Oh. Uh, let's start uh, talking about how I discovered the bug. Okay, this is the history. This is the history. I um, I uh, was assigned to research to uh, do a research about uh, a patch in the OpenBSD kernel, named the um, the number eight patch, a reliability fix. This was uh, in fact a, a hang of the kernel, an infinite loop in the kernel caused by uh, fragmented ICMP packets. So. I give us, uh, I, my boss come and, and tell me if I could reproduce this, this bug. So I started to, to try to, to build uh, a fuzzer. Do you know what a fuzzer is? It's a little program to send malformer packets and try to train to break the system to reproduce, reproduce the, the bug. So. It uh, really didn't, I really didn't have very much information about the bug, so uh, the only thing that I could do is to start trying and studying the, the patch, trying to make a, a couple of fragmented packets and send it to a, a, to a OpenBSD system, uh, trying to make it to break, to, to, to lock in an infinite loop. So the faster is a very simple program. I made it in Python. Uh, it only makes uh, two packets from the IPv6 protocol. The IPv6 protocol, protocol is, a, as you know, a very new protocol. It's not very much used, and it, it's got a lot of bugs. I will be presenting some this bug, and in the end, maybe I will do uh, some live demonstration about another vulnerabilities. I spent about two days trying to build in my former packet, uh, thinking how uh, I could break the system, um, and in the in the end, I in a lucky in a lucky packet managed to to break the system. I I sent it to an OpenBCD virtual machine, and the, and the OpenBCD kernel just hung up. But it was not an infinite loop like the, the patch was seen. It was a, a a complete hang up. It, the system just uh, hung up and threw a, a stack trace of the bug. I was thinking, this is really is not the same bug that I was trying to find. Maybe it's a new bug. So the thing that I did was uh, to download the latest version of OpenBSD kernel. It was at the time the 4.1 OpenBSD kernel, and uh, trying to attack against that kernel. The attacks worked anyway. So uh, in my hands, I, I did have a, what is called a zero day or a new unpatched, unpatched vulnerability. In the time I was thinking it was a general service and maybe it could result in code execution, but I was not really sure about it. So uh, I reported to my boss. My boss in fa in, uh, reported to OpenBCD team and got fixed in about two days. They were very, very fast and fixed the bug. But they reported it as a Daniel of service of, of a reliability fix. And I was thinking that this was not a reliability fix. It really was an exploitable bug because of the stack trace. So uh, I started researching how to exploit this bug. Let's, let's see uh, um, why the bug was hanging the camera. Okay, these are, um, let's see, in the, in the, uh, a lot of Unix systems, the network packets are stored in a structures named MBAFs. 
the end buffs are uh, little uh, packets of, of memory of a fixed length. Uh, they are about uh, 256 bytes long. They are ordered in a linked list in memory and they store network packets um, inside them. And if the network packet is, is if the network packet is too big to fit inside the MBAF, the MBAF uh, got a external memory buffer. But the, fa the failure of the kernel was that the kernel was overwriting the, a lot of MBAF uh, buffers in the way that yeah, it's showing there. Instead of writing in, into the first MBAF, MBAF1, the OpenBSD kernel was overwriting a lot of, of these buffers, and uh, not only the buffer, but the header information inside the buffers and the couple of pointers that link uh, the buffers, uh, the linked list. So when the OpenBSD, OpenBSD system was trying to free one of these packets, uh, it made a unlink operation. That is a unlink operation. It's an exchange of two pointers to, to free the, the node between them. And uh, because of the pointer was overwriting with garbage, at the time was garbage, the system was hanging, was uh, making an illegal, an illegal operation, and it totally hanged. This uh, seemed like a very exploitable bug because when you overwrite two pointers, you, you can use a, a very common technique, namely the mirror copy or, or, um, or four byte write. You, when you exchange two pointers and you can uh, control the pointers, you can uh, manage to write four bytes of data in, every, in any place of the memory. So I, I was thinking, if I am overwriting a linked list, it sure is, it's uh, almost sure that it's a exploitable bug. So I started to disassemble the OpenMSD kernel to see if I could exploit the bug. Mm, well, maybe you can, it's, it's not uh, show it very well, but it, here is a disassemble of the function that was hanging. The function that was hanging was a free function. I see in the down, the M free M function was crashing. Here. Here. The M free M function was crashed. That is the function that free and no, uh, uh, M buff. So I disassembled this function. That is the result. I must say that the OpenBSD kernel is an open source kernel, and I really did have the, the C code of the source code of the, that function. But I am really more used to see it this way, to see it in assembly, uh, to analyze the function in assembly. It's, uh, uh, it's more easy for me to see it this way. The function is starting in the orange uh, block, and we can see, if we could see it, uh, maybe it's that the, the packet to free it is stored in the register. I uh, must clarify that this, uh, this assembler is for the Pentium and 32 bits only. OpenBSD run in a lot of architectures, but this exploit is uh, only for Pentium at 32, 32 bits, sorry. Um, in the start, this function plays the packet to be freed in the one register, in the ASI register. And then it made a lot of operation uh, using this register of uh, reference. Uh, the point uh, in a, um, the point in, uh, what the, the kernel was breaking is making yellow. Is um, well, you didn't can see it very well, but it's, uh, it exchanges the pointers here in the block making in the point in the block uh, painted yellow. The point the pointers of the linked list are being exchanged. And of course, the linked list was overwriting, and it was trying to write in a position of memory that uh, did not exist. So it broke exactly in the yellow block. So I say, OK, let's try to reach the yellow block with controller pointers. So I can write in any place of the memory. If I can write a value in any place of the memory, I can do a lot of things, like uh, make my uh, user process root, or uh, open, um, I don't know, 
uh, change uh, the permission of, uh, of the new process. I, there are not very much things that I could do, but some things it could be done and it will be exploitable this way. And when, while I was analyzing this, I realized something. I realized that in the next block, in the block next to them, to, to the yellow block, was a call and uh, the referencing a pointer. It was uh, getting a pointer from the block here in the in the in the arrow in the arrow in this part. Oh, let's see. In in this part, it's moving a value from the packet inside the EAX register, and then in the next block, it's jumping to this EAX register. It's, in fact, it's calling them, but it's the same as jumping. So I could send a value here, a, a value here uh, inside the packet and make that OpenBCD jump exactly what I want. So I can control the flow of execution much in a much easier way than uh, trying to do the other trick of the yellow block, that writing in some part of the memory. I, uh, it's much easier to jump to any place that I want because I could send my code and place my code or my shell code in some place of the memory and make the kernel jump to the jump it and uh, I will get con total control of the kernel. Of course, I will gain execution inside the kernel and it's not, uh, it's not uh, an ideal uh, situation. The ideal situation was to gain control in a user process because a kernel exploit is much difficult to do than a user exploit. Because in a user exploit, you got the kernel to do whatever you want. You can use the kernel to open a file or to open a connection. It's much easier. The kernel is uh, is made for that. You, in, when you do a, a user exploit, when only uh, like a hundred instructions, you can you call uh, you can make the machine do what you want. It's a very small exploit. But in kernel mode, you really don't have a kernel. You don't have an operating system to make use of. So you are, it's almost like you are your own operative system. Anyway, I was gaining execution inside the kernel and I was executing my code. So I tell the OpenBSD people that uh, in fact this bug was exploitable. I still didn't have the exploit. The exploit took me about a couple of weeks to make because it was a very difficult exploit and I was helped by uh, a lot of people from Com for kernel security. But uh, anyway, now I am in the situation that I can jump to any place that I want in the memory. But where I want to jump? Of course, I cannot jump to the same kernel because the same kernel is not my call. I want to jump to my call so I can overtake, overtake uh, the system. First, I must, I must place the code in memory in some way. Well, in this uh, transparency, they are marked the source code in C, the equivalent of that function. Here's the assembly, and here's the part of the source code that makes the call. It's a little difficult to understand. It's marked in, in red, it's marked the, the part of the source code, the source code that jump to the, the, reference, the, the referential pointer. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's much easier to understand in assembly than it is in, in C. It's a very, a uh, lot of micro expansions. If I never will realize the bug, looking only to the, to the source code. Okay, that's bad. Okay, in this drawing, you can see how the Fragmented packets of ICMP v6 are placed in memory. In the right, I, uh, we have the linker list of MBAF or MBAF chain with uh, the corresponding uh, headers. In the headers of the MBAF are pointers to the next MBAF, pointer to the last MBAF, pointer to the free function. And the packets are placed in exactly that way in memory, are placed, are overwriting a couple of M buffers or M buff, and the arrow here. This arrow marks the exact position of where the pointer to jump is placed in memory. So I must place a pointer here 
this pointer will be override will override the free fun the free function inside the header and this function this function we call the pointer that I, that I, have, that I, the pointer that I place there um, here oh. Oh. here is a trampoline you can really see it but it's a trampoline trampoline is a name for a position of memory that I want to jump I want to jump to a trampoline so I put this pointer in the header of the MBAF in exact position. You can be not even one byte, uh, one byte um, disaligned. It, be, it's ma it must be exactly aligned to the pointer. But it's something very easy to do. Uh, okay, let's continue. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, we can now jump to any place of the memory that we want. But where is where uh, is the shellcode located? We know that the shellcode is located here. Here is a shellcode. It's placed next in the same packet because it's very it's very easy to put the shellcode in the same packet that caused the overflow. So we got this portion of memory. We got all code the share code or the code that we want to execute. But we don't know where this is placed because the MBAF are the dynamic and places and it could be in any place of the of the kernel memory. It's not in a fixed position. It will change. It will change from run to run and from kernel to kernel. But we know one thing. We know that the share code is pointed to the ASI register. The ASI register point exactly where our shellcode begins. Why is that? Well, because it, that is, is how the function was compiled. We remember. We remember that the packet in the beginning of the function was pointed to ASI. Was pointed here. So if the packet is pointed to ASI and we do I immediately jump to to somewhere that we want that we want. We must jump to uh, some place in memory that jump back to, S to uh, the position of the uh, ASI register. It's like a bounce. We bounce in a point of the kernel memory that have an intrusion uh, that jump back to the AS ASI register. We must find a position, uh, position of the kernel. Uh, this is the kernel. We must jump. We must find a position of the kernel that got an instruction that jump back to the ASI register. This instruction is a very small instruction. They are no more than two bytes long. And it's placed a thousand of times in the kernel. So it's very easy to find one instruction. It could be in any place of the kernel. It not only must be there and be executable. So we find one instruction. It could be any. We find one instruction that jump to the ASI register. And we simply we jump there. So. We jump in this instruction, that instruction jump back to our shellcode, and we are executing our shellcode now. We have completely control of the system. You, I was thinking, OK, game over. It's, it's over, but it's not over. Because as I was seeing, the kernel, you really can't do anything in kernel mode. You, I, nev I can't even open a file. I can open a connection to the internet, because I am running in kernel mode. And it's a very tricky. And this is a really tricky part to make the exploit work in kernel mode because it must be like a mini operative system. It should be. Okay, there are a lot of ways to do it. This, but this is the way that uh, we uh, we do, uh, that we implemented, and this this way it really works works pretty pretty fine. In kernel mode, there are not many things that you can do, but you can do very easily hook interruption. You can get the interruption table of the Pentium, the Pentium processor, and you can hook. You can make that uh, one interruption to jump to you, and you instead uh, jump to the original interruption. So what I was, was, uh, what I was did was uh, to hook this particular interruption, the system call, 
the operating system communicate with the user uh, process uh, using an uh, interruption in Unix. One in Windows is, uh, more this is similar, but in Unix, the interruption number used is always the 80 interruption. So I must hook this interruption, the 80 interruption, in the same way that uh, the old element in a style resident uh, program from, from DOS. In DOS, uh, there were a kind of program, maybe you, you remember that, that hooked the interruption, the timer interruption or the keyboard interruption, and in that way, it's still resident in memory. Okay, this is the same technique, but we hook the system call interruption. This is the original system call. We got a user process here. The user process make a system call, I don't know, open a file, or kernel open an uh, internet connection, and the kernel open the uh, internet connection and returns to the user in the next instruction. And here is how it, uh, uh, the hook is made. The system process, the user process, sorry, jump to the hook that I have installed in the memory, and the hook make uh, something that I want, and then return to the original system call, and the system call is made and returned to the user. So yeah, the user uh, really don't, don't know if he uh, don't realize that it's calling my call. He thinks that it's calling the kernel, but it's not calling the kernel. It's calling my shell call in memory. Uh, okay, so it's calling my shell call. What we do in this situation? Okay, we. Now we can see every system call of the system. We can see every process and every uh, operation of all the process of the system. This is a very useful thing. So I implemented, uh, this is the pseudo call of the uh, operation of the hook, the interruption hook. First, we don't want to affect any user process because we will, in this way, we, we will hang the machine. We, uh, and not every user process uh, are useful to us. Only the privileged user process are useful. The, the user process with a privilege of root. Because if we uh, take over a process with no privileges, uh, it will be very useful. Uh, I wa we want to take over a user process with root privileges. So first, we want to, to uh, to see if the process calling us is root. Of course, this is a very hard thing to do because we cannot simply get the process ID or the user's ID of the process because, because again, we are in kernel mode. We must do a lot of tricks to do this. First, in user mode, you use call, uh, um, system call call uh, get PID or get process ID. So just simply of that. The, that's system call, returns a number, and that number says is you are root or not. But now, we must do a little magic here. We first search for this press, for this variable in the kernel memory, because the kernel can be any kernel. It can be a OpenBSD 3 kernel or 4, or can be a custom compiler kernel. And this variable, the current process variable, in fact, it's an array, it's not a variable, could be any place of the memory. So we must search it. We must search through all the memory, searching for patterns, for a specific patterns, of memory that tell us where this variable is placed. These patterns are present in every OpenBSD version from 10 years ago and are very easy to find. Once that we got this current process variable, we can see inside this variable, in fact it's a structure, it's not a variable, where is the, what is the user ID of the process. So. Now we got the user ID of the process, and if the user ID is zero, the process is root, and we can't take over, take over this process. So if the process is root, we must place, we must uh, attack this process. We know that uh, the process has full privilege of the system, and it's much easier to execute code in user land or user mode than in kernel mode. So we got a process that is root is calling us. We must take over this process. First, we must uh, execute code in this process. We could just uh, overwrite uh, the, the return pointer. Um, the return pointer of the process should be in, uh, is, uh, we uh, because we are kernel, we can overwrite any place in the memory. We could just overwrite the return address 
But this is not a very good thing to do because maybe this process, uh, the process that are, that are calling us, the, the binary that are calling us, is the libc. The libc is a library that is, uh, is very important on, in the system. We, we can't just overwrite the libc because the G system will, will crash within because every process I are using the libc. We cannot overwrite the binary. We must place our shellcode in another place. A good place to, pay to, to put our shellcode is the stack, because the stack is one for every process, and it's very easy to, to reserve memory on the stack, push or put our shellcode there, and execute our shellcode on the stack. But there is a problem with that approach, that is this protection. This protection is a very good protection that OpenBSD got uh, that says that no, no, no place in the memory that is writable is executable. The memory can be or writable or executable, but not both. So is that, is that is exactly what we want to do. We want to write in the stack and execute in that, in that, in the, in that place. So the OpenBSD kernel will, will not let us to do this. We must disable this protection. This protection can be disabled because we are kernel and we can modify every register of the Pentium processor because we got complete control. So, how we disable this protection? We extend the selectors. The selectors, the OpenBSD implement this protection, uh, changing the selectors and uh, making some selectors shorter, some selectors larger. And the specific selector that is, pro, it is affecting that it don't let us to to execute our code in the stack is this selector, the code selector, of course. We must extend this selector. We extend this uh, anyway. This is not very important, but this selector is very important. We must extend the code selector, or CS, to let us execute code in the stack. This extend, next, extending a selector can be made in, can be a uh, can be made in, user, in a user process. A user process can extend selector because it doesn't have permis uh, permissions to do that. But we are in kernel, so we can extend the selector. Once that uh, this protection is down, we simply copy the user mode in the stack and execute that. We modify, we modify the return address to the point or a point of the stack. And when the system can return, it will return to the stack. Instead of returning to the binary image of the process, it will return to the stack. And we'll execute there uh, perfectly because this protection is down. So now we are executing uh, our shell code in a user process. Uh, and it's much easier to do, to, uh, to do things in, in that place, like uh, and open a connection or, I don't know, uh, adding a user, uh, writing a file, telling kernel, because, uh, because now we are a user and we can make use of the kernel. In the end, of course, we must restore the original interruption vector, because if we don't do this, every root process will be uh, owned, will be uh, take over, and we don't want that because uh, we want to, to take over only one process. We only need that. We don't need to, uh, to take over all the root process of the machine. So we restore or remove the hook, restore the original interruption vector, and that is, now we got one process, the first process that are calling us, root and executing all code. This process could be uh, anyone. Can be the send mail process. Can be the Apache, uh, I don't know how we say, Apache, the web server. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in I was uh, seeing that uh, every time I sent the exploit, the send mail process was the first that was a uh, takeover. The send mail make uh, a lot of system calls, and uh, it's root, and it's, the, it's every almost uh, every time is the, the send mail process uh, is the, the first that is attacked by this exploit. And if we are not root, if the if some other process call uh, the kernel and yes, not root, we just continue with the original system call and we don't modify it because uh, we are really done is uh, interested in attack uh, in attacking a process that is not root. Okay, this is a diagram. Uh, oh, we got a little problem here. 
there should be a line here and a line here too. This is a map of the memory of the Pentium 32-bit processor uh, and how OpenBSD managed it. We got four gigabyte, gigabyte long and the OpenBSD system uh, reserves the first part of the memory uh, for executing binary code here. So the only executable code can be placed here in this small part of the memory. This code will be grow a little. Can, can, it is viable, can uh, stand a little f further, but only this place of the memory is executable, and this place of the memory is not executable, but it's writable. Here is the data memory, the heap and the stack. So this is the operation that we, we do. We extend the code selector that only reached here originally, and we extend it from to here, all the way to the world memory, so we can execute ev in or code in this area too. We also extend the DS, the data segment, just because it's not really necessary. Well, so a little assembler. This is the implementation of the pseudo code that I was showing. It's uh, maybe a little, uh, this, it uses some instruction that are not commonly used in user mode. Uh, like this one and this one that store global description table and store local description table because the selector are stored in these tables uh, that the Pentium processor use to, uh, to store uh, the, the, the selector in the same. So we first store the selector in some place in the memory, could be any place. We choose to store the, in the ISP in the ISP and the stack in the stack itself. This section of the code are a lot of operation used to to assemble the selector because the, selem the selectors are not uh, contiguous in memory. Are uh, a little I don't know like this I uh, disassemble I some place in one byte and some byte later are other part of the selector. I don't know why this is uh, is uh, uh, the Intel engineers uh, uh, made it that way. I don't know what because, but you must assemble the selector using a lot of Boolean operations. And these two final instruction extend the selectors, place it only a, a value in a specific place of the memory. Then we must load again the selector. Here is not the part that load uh, that loads the selectors back into the Pentium processor. It's not showed, but it's, uh, it's next. Okay, but uh, is, we are not really finished yet. I was saying this exploit is a little complex because OpenBSD is a clever process system and in the next context switch will restore the selectors. So if we are happily executing in the stack, but if the process, our context switches, uh, switches back, if we, uh, the process will crash because the protection, this protection, WXRX, Oh, this is my WXOX uh, will be enabled again and the process will crash. Will, uh, the execution of the shellcode will be detected by the operating system. So we must try to get a, a portion of memory that are uh, execute, uh, that are writable and executable forever. How we do that? We can uh, use two, uh, we got two options to do that. In fact, we, sh we maybe got more than two options, but these are the two options that I think of. The first one is to use another system call because I am executing in user mode. I can, uh, I can call any system call that I want, and I call this one that is named mProtect. The system call is used to uh, give any portion of memory any uh, any permission that I want. So I just unprotect all the stack. I say to the operating system uh, that uh, I know I want to execute code in the stack using this. And the operative system just will make the, all the whole stack executable, like it was a window, a Windows 95, and will be executable forever. We now do a couple of things to to fix the original process because because we don't want to the same my process of the web server process to crash. We want to make a new process and uh, and to keep the original process attacker to function uh, to to work okay to work uh, normally. So we first 
fork the process, make a clone of the process. And uh, now we got two processes that are uh, the same. In one of the of those process, we fix all the stack, we fix all the things that we overwrite, and continues to execute normally. So if we attack at the, the send mail process, the send mail process, we, we continue to execute uh, like if nothing was uh, happening. And the forget process will be executing our code forever. Forever in a secure uh, position of the memory because we unprotected, uh, unprotected that memory and uh, it's over. Now we are got a root processor executing our shared code. There is another way to do this, that is to do another function call that is called a map or memory map. We just ask the operative system to give us uh, a special portion of memory that is not in the stack, but is writable and executable. So we just copy our shared code in that new uh, portion of memory and execute from there. And, and in the next context switch, there is nothing that can uh, stop our execution because it's a, it's a reserver in a portion of memory. Okay, uh, and this is the end of the exploit. Uh, we are now uh, got a root process executing our code in user mode. This is a sample of uh, what is uh, what looks like uh, this exploit. Here is an, a terminal of OpenBSD um, executing and asking for a login prompt. And I'm sending here uh, the, the couple of packets. Inside the shape code, I have, uh, I've inserted a breakpoint of an uh, interruption tree. So this blue part here, in fact, is the debugger of, uh, or the kernel debugger of, of OpenBSD, the DDB is called. We can see, maybe you can see here that it's not hanged, the kernel has stopped because it's a breakpoint, it's not a crash. Here, in the, in here we ask the debugger to continue to execution, and here the OpenBSD system have, is continuous with normal execution, but now it's hooked. Now we got all code hooked in the interruption, uh, interruption IT. Now uh, I would like to do a live demo of this I hope it will work, it may be not work, but to make it a little more interesting, I'm gonna do a live demo. Okay, now we are launched a virtual machine with the OpenBSD 4 operative system. And we're going to launch another virtual machine using the Linux operative system that will send the, uh, the packets to this virtual machine. The virtual machines are connected together with a host only network. It's like a virtual network between the two virtual, ma virtual machines. Maybe we going to have some problem with we, some problems with the resolution. I hope not. Uh, I, I think I, we gonna have some problem with the resolution. Could you please uh, make the, the screen a little a little smaller because I can't see the, the top of the screen. I can't move the, the window. Okay, now the, the top, please. Uh, there you go. Let's see. That is. Okay. 
In the right side is the shell code. Writing is in Python language. Uh, and I'm going to launch the shell code in the other window here. Okay, here we can see that the OpenBSD kernel has stopped because the attack at work, uh, the attack works, and it's stopped in a breakpoint because inside the shellcode I, I have a place as a breakpoint, and we can ask the operator the debugger just to continue with the execution, uh, and the kernel of course will be hooked with our shellcode. Now the, uh, the OpenBSD kernel has a hook in the interruption and is working uh, perfectly normal, like, like if nothing has happened. But in fact, our shell code is inside the interruption vec vector now. Okay, that was one of the live demonstration, uh, but uh, researching about the IPv6 protocol, the IPv6 protocol is, uh, is not very much used and is uh, active, active by default in a lot of operating systems. And uh, that is a receipt for a lot of failures and a lot of uh, bugs and uh, vulnerabilities. I will to show another ones that I have discovered as a part of my research. Um, uh, okay, using virtual machines. So we will go continue with this. This uh, couple of vulnerabilities are for the Linux operating system. We're gonna use the Ubuntu distribution, it's one of the most used distribution of Linux. Okay, this is a, a Linux kernel, the latest one, the 2.6.22 kernel, and um, it's a custom kernel, this one. Okay, it's a custom kernel, and I will uh, send a couple of uh, ICMP packets. Uh, to him to see how uh, how he respond. Oh, here we can see it. This is uh, Linux asking for a uh, for a login. Oh, sorry, this is not. Ah, uh, sorry, I get confused. That was not the attack. Now we can see that the Linux kernel is hanged. This is uh, because we have sent another couple of uh, IPv6 packet. It's another protocol. But the Linux kernel, uh, you can see, as uh, is hanged. Uh, I'm going to show you one thing. Maybe you can see the lights are blinking here. This is how a uh, Linux kernel, uh, uh, Linux kernel for, for protection is shown with. This Linux is hung very, very few times, but when it hangs, it just blink the, the caps lock key. It's a bit very strange to see the Linux kernel hang it, but it's, it hangs sometimes. This is a denial, denial of service attack, and in fact, it's not a zero day, so it's patched. It's patched, but it's in the very latest version of the Linux that has come out, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. But um, it's not backported. Oh, you mean you maybe you have a, a Linux system over here? I'm gonna to to attack a completely actualized Ubuntu system to see if they have patched this vulnerability. Yeah. 
Okay, you can see this is a kernel 2.6 plus 20 uh, slash uh, 16 is the latest one. Uh, I have actualized, uh, actualized the kernel um, yesterday around at 12 p.m. at 12 uh, uh, midnight, and it was the same kernel. So it, this is the latest kernel from the Ubuntu system. Okay, we're going to launch the last, the same vulnerability, the same packets. Okay. Well, great. The Ubuntu system survived perfectly. But we're going to launch the first attack. There's some other attack. Oh, damn. So you got there a uh, full patch of Ubuntu system that is still have a vulnerability. All for it because IPv6 was activated by default. So uh, this talk is go is over now. But uh, I want you to say some only one thing that is if you got a Unix system or a Linux system and you got IP activated and you don't use it, please uh, deactivate this. It. It's pretty easy to do because you can see uh, there are very bad people there and uh, they can uh, do things like this. So thank you. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask me now. <laughs> I don't know. Sí. Well, I uh, in the ICMP packet has a data um, a data part that uh, is supposed to be replicated in the in the in the answer of the ICMP packet. And I place simply in that portion of the packet. It's a big packet, like a 1,000 byte long. And the shellcode, in fact, is something like, uh, I don't know, seven, 700 bytes. It fits perfectly in the second ICMP uh, payload. It's in that part. I could send uh, the exploit in a lot of, in another ways, like, uh, I don't know, flooding the system with shell codes. The system will place the shell code uh, any place in the memory. Maybe you call, you're going to fill the memory with the shell code. And I can't just jump anywhere in the memory because uh, the shell code surely will be there. Because if I send, I don't know, uh, 10 megabytes of, of, um, of traffic to the, to the OpenBSD system, it's going to put it in some way, in some place in the memory. Okay. If there is no question, no more question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that's all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>